start the session by lighting the lamp. you through the session for today. Srishti Ma'am will be discussing the answer writing uh, a book written by her. The glimpse into her book will be done. And as you all know, there are a lot of good reviews by students who are freshers and veterans. And uh, in collaboration with UPSC Guy, IAS Baba is pleased to have her here today. Also, today is special because we'll be launching our batch three of our USP program, ILP, that is Integrated Learning Program 2023. It is the biggest self-study program for UPSC. Daily targets, daily tests, prelims and mains test series, NCRT coverage, value-added notes, CSAT and mind maps are given. Today, because Shrishti Ma'am is here, we are giving a launch offer which is valid only for today. Those who are enrolling today can use the code SRISHTI10 to avail a discount of flat 10%. There are t free books will be issued for those joining today to the ILP program. Now I request founder Mohan sir to address the gathering. Hello. Uh, Good afternoon to all of you. I know it's very, very, very hot. Uh, it is said that marriages are made in heaven. <laughs> I, I, I assume what is the next sentence? Like all of you know the next sentence. So for civil servants, for quite a few civil servants, marriage is made in Lavasna. And uh, today we have two such uh, cute couples, the power couples, uh, Nagarjun Gauda and uh, Shushti Deshmukh Gauda, 2019 IAS batch. Uh, and uh, I don't have to introduce them formally. Uh, uh, there's a huge fan following for them and that I can see it here. Just in two days of uh, the post that got published, we had more than 7,000 registrations for this event. So that speaks volumes of it. And uh, they, I mean, it, I don't know the right adjective to use. Uh, they have a huge fan following or probably their, everything that they post on the social media is viral. Right, in fact, uh, I'm not much uh, active on the social media. Probably I have to learn a few things from both of them. Probably after the session I'll learn. And uh, yeah, uh, she, uh, about Shrusti, uh, like she, she, she was one of the toppers, I mean, toppers in 2018 uh, UPSC exam and uh, most importantly, her GA score was 470. Uh, that, I mean, not everybody can score. See, getting 400, 420, 430, it is achievable, but uh, getting 470 is something insane or only a few people can do it and uh, she has done it. Uh, congrats, uh, congratulations for that. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I was always thinking about this answer writing book. Who else would be the best person or better person to write it? And she has come out with that book. I would uh, congratulate her for that and all the best for that. Uh, and finally, I'll warmly welcome uh, our uh, Sose. How many of you understand Canada? Uh, Sose or Bahu, right? I warmly welcome her to Karnataka and to IS Baba. <laughs> and to her son, Maga, that is son of soil. <laughs> Nagarjun Gauda, right? Mandya the Gandu. <laughs> Right. If you look at him, is uh, to describe him is a sida, sada, a boy next door. Right. Very humble. And even in fact, what mistake me and Tausif did was when we were lighting the lamp, we forgot to remove our shoes. But then I saw both of them had removed their s shoes and slippers, and they had come here. That speaks volumes of them. Yeah. And uh, again, as I said, sada, sida. Boy next door, and I'm proud that he's a Kannadiga, Kannad Dono, Karnatak Dono, and Thaile. Yeah, probably if Nan Yavak speech could reach the Vizal Bandir Lilla, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we can understand uh, their celebrity status, all that. And uh, Nagarjun is. I mean, a uh, diverse personality. He loves pets. He is into. He try loves traveling. He dances. Idala so in Insta dalim noder vodo. So his personality is what has got him that uh, one of the highest marks in the interview. That is 193. A huge round of applause to <laughs> Nagarjun. Yeah, I'll not take much of your time. I'll leave the dais open uh, to the power couples to speak and guide you on um, exclusively on mains answer writing. Thank you. First of all, power couple in Allah. So, everything looks uh, greener on the other side, Antaral Ange. Uh, Once you come yes. into service, there is no power. It's all about hard work and uh, too much of... It is about all about uh, hard work. Yeah. It's no a, Sundays. So, first of all, I would like to apologize, apologize that we are half an hour late. So, as I was telling, downstairs are healthy there. Madam had uh, uh, underestimated Bangalore traffic. <laughs> so, so, Paleta got to be. So that's why we got late and we had just landed early morning. So that's why we got late. So we are very sorry for that, to making yes. you wait in this. Yes, uh, and very uh, hot. the place here is as well. It's it's a bit hot. I am seeing that you're getting fruity. So I think you should be able to put up with the the place for some more time. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this particular session uh, is planned on answer writing. Handling means how do you approach preparation for general studies papers and how do you go for attempting your UPSC mains paper. So uh, we will be touching uh, all of these aspects one by one together. And um, I would like to, uh, I would want to keep this session more interactive because uh, a one way kind of a session you would be seeing of a lot of toppers on YouTube. But the fact that we are here all today, this so you can directly ask your questions to us. And in case we are telling something and you feel like that there's something that you want to add on that particular, uh, ask on that particular topic, so you can just put your hands up, right? So we'll keep it interactive. We'll keep it two way, right? So the first question for you is, um, how many of you are writing mains this year? Okay. How many of you have written mains? All right. 
So uh, a major part of the crowd is, will be writing means next year or the year after. Okay, so we'll keep it that way. And uh, I would like to first begin by telling you the importance of, this mic is for us. Is it fine from here? Can you hear me? A bit near, okay. Yes, so we'll begin by why answer writing is important. So, uh, general studies. How many papers do we have for general studies? Four papers. What else do we have in written? We have optionals, we have compulsory language, and we have essay. So, I will give you, uh, I will start by giving you my own example. My total score for UPSC was 1068, right? And my GS score, as Sir was telling you, was 470. That makes around 45% of my score coming only from GS. Why I'm telling you is that the major part of why I got the rank that I got was my score in general studies. Because if you look at my scores in optionals and essay and interview, they're pretty on the average side, right? So uh, on average of the other toppers. But what made me uh, reach that rank was my general studies score. So this speaks volumes about how much you can gain out of preparing for those four GS papers how well you can practice it in advance, and what kind of returns you can get in your overall score from the general studies papers, right? So uh, the first, we will first start with uh, how do you prepare? This is giving me four. We will start by, uh, yes. We will start by uh, how do we prepare? So there is a common question from students, how do you make notes? Yes, this is a very common question which all of you, all of us have when we start preparing. And uh, notes, when you say you, I'll talk about three different parts of it. The first is how do you make notes of the current affairs? Yes, this sounds tricky to us. So what I used to do was, I used to read a particular newspaper. I used to read Hindu. Then I started reading Indian Express and the latest stages of my preparation. You can choose either of them. Uh, you can read the newspaper and try to specifically focus on the editorial section. And for that, I used to make my own notes. So when I say own notes, what I mean is, I used to note down some important statements, some good facts, some statistics, some quotation, or some international report which is quoted there. When you do that for an editorial, what happens is, you are creating your own data bank. You are creating your own line of thought in that particular topic. And I had categorized them uh, according to the different topics of the general studies. So I had made history, uh, huh. geography. Generally, in current affairs, you'll not have much of history, geography. You'll more have polity, economy, Indian society. What else? Science and tech, IR, international relations. So I had categorized the topics. And I used to note down whatever editorial importance which I used to find in that particular head. So that gave me, at the end of one year, I had my own set of notes for all important topics that were there for that year. So when you say current affairs, if you're giving the exam for 2023, from January 2022, your current affairs become important. From Jan 22 for the next year, Jan, uh, for the next year exam of 2023, that much is sufficient, because more or less the themes will remain same. Only the facts will change, like the amount of poverty, you know, different different facts. So the GS2 you have in GS3 different facts. So those will change, but over a year the theory part will more or less remain the same. So one thing what I would want to say here is, uh, I used to not make much of a notes. I am not a note making person. But I could say that it might, it might have costed me a few marks. So now, uh, after maybe I married Rusty, I, I could see her notes. So I saw her notes which was lying in there at her house. Like uh, She had made so much of notes. Maybe it's a pura like uh, to bundle notes. Ito. And they were very crisp to the point. And she had made lots of notes. And maybe that has helped in her uh, general study score, I would say. I always tell that the more organized your notes are, the more better your answers will come out to be. Reason being, our brain is like a library. 
and if you are not categorizing it into different subjects if you just you know keeping it ki you know i'll just pick up from an overall yearly compilation and i'll be able to manage it you will be able to manage it but to ace the exam with good score and get the service of your choice you will have to put in a bit more of effort right so i would advise you to uh, you know make out your own uh, this thing from the editorials at least rest current affairs you can cover from online websites uh, the next thing is static gs uh, one more thing i would like to add in current affairs so you get lot of uh, uh, value added material from coaching institutes take from some reliable uh, institute which make uh, good uh, current affairs notes so you uh, as madam was telling editorial notes nive maadkoli bere edukke you try to uh, depend upon some institute ka uh, notes if you are not so much into note making but if you are doing it very well and good and coming to static gs what uh, we both thought was like static gs ali it is note making is very uh, individual this one choice so you may choose to make notes for uh, maybe history or geography or you may not so it will not affect much in uh, at the end i would say because what happens is some of your books say we read m lakshmi kan for polity yes now this this book is in itself in a form of notes if you end up making notes of that book you'll do a photocopy because always already the book is very condensed very to the point and you know sort of vast which is required for the exam so for that you need not go into that so say for example you're referring to dd basu for polity now dd basu is bit vast deep and if you are not a pubat student then you don't need that much of it so you can sort of just pick up some important themes like say center state relations or dpsp or fundamental rights you can pick up those themes from that book and then you can make some bit notes of that what notes does is is keeps in your head and in your copy it sort of consolidates your information and it becomes easier for you to revise so we will talk about revision but at the outset i'll tell you that no matter how much you read the only thing which you can revise matters because you are reading so much vast things you have so many subjects to read so if you end up just making notes and not revising them there is no use of them right so you have to understand this basic you have to keep in mind the revision factor also in your head so we'll move on optional yeah uh when it comes to note making of optionals i would say this is this should be compulsory new optional uh, i would stick to english you should make notes of optional so my, my optional was medical science so as i told i was not a make note making person i i used to hate making notes right from school but for optional i had to make notes because you cannot revise optional in a week so it is so vast that to particularly technical subjects like uh, medical science and all it's so vast that you can't revise in a week so you have to make your own notes so what i used to i did was like i made uh, one of my a few of my friends make notes for me and i used to read that <laughs> but but the point to take away from here is not sure we are getting those friends everybody of us so i more was a you know work strive hard that kind of a thing so he got friends who could make notes for him i'm not sure if you all would get that yeah but optional may you should definitely make your own notes your own notes will definitely add much value than uh, reading somebody else notes this medical science has notes available on internet of one of our senior so it's really good but if you read that you will not you will not be able to uh, grasp it as much as you have prepared on your own so optional notes making is very uh, very much necessary even if you don't make any other notes you make sure that you will make your own optional notes okay fine then so uh, we will now move on to gs papers 1 2 3 4 individually and uh, we'll discuss some important themes of that paper and we will discuss the preparation frameworks of it yeah so uh, the first is gs1 what do we have in gs1 history geography world history post independence history then indian society what else art and culture correct so i think that is all that we have in gs1 so all these subjects are pretty vast in their nature yes if you are studying uh, history you have to just start from the back to the you know the post independence part of it the entire freedom movement in geography if you pick there are different parts of it landforms in economic geography so many parts so this gs paper is going to be vast it's going to take more 
टाइम ऑफ योर्स सो आई वुड सजेस्ट कीप दैट इन योर हेड यू डोंट हैव सम क्विक पॉइंटर्स लाइक इन जी एस थ्री यू कैन जस्ट यू नो कीप ऑन फिनिशिंग टॉपिक्स फास्ट दैट्स नॉट हैपनिंग इन जी एस वन सो बी प्रिपेयर फॉर दैट वेन यू स्टार्ट प्रिपरेशन फॉर इट अदर थिंग विच आई वुड लाइक टू से इज इफ यू लुक एट द पेपर ऑफ द प्रीवियस ईयर पेपर्स ऑफ जी एस वन यू विल फाइंड दैट देर आर लॉट ऑफ रिपीटेड थीम्स इन द पेपर देर आर अ कपल ऑफ टॉपिक्स एंड दिस आई हैव मैंशन स्पेसिफिकली इन माई बुक एज वेल देर आर सर्टन टॉपिक्स एंड थीम्स विच कम मोर ऑल एस एवरी ईयर now we know that the exam is going to be a bit unpredictable and we don't know what you're facing but in mains there is a lot that you can prepare for in advance say there is a theme called regionalism if you look at the papers you will have one question or the other on regionalism they will try to connect regionalism with uh, state formation interstate relation or something like that so why not prepare a framework in advance of that topic right so we know that a question is coming out of it so why not prepare a good definition why not prepare a good example why not look into the current affairs of what specifically happened this year about this particular subject when you do that you're creating your own framework of that topic and then in the exam if you face any question with regionalism anything you at least have a you at least have a framework to start with and that gives you immense confidence on that day correct so uh, my thing will be please go on repeating go on focusing on the themes which are repetitive in nature uh, and from current affairs like we were trying to tell them uh, when it comes to gs1 so you if you take up gs1 question paper if you observe so what you should learn is to observe the past previous year question papers so so many toppers say ki like you read previous year question papers see, read read previous year question papers what so you must be wondering what to read in previous year question they are just questions no but but you should also understand that there is a hidden uh, way of asking questions in all the matlab uh, question papers if you go through you should you just have to observe that so when it comes to gs1 so generally what they do is so they take up some static topic and they link it with the current so generally they will have two parts first part they will uh, it uh, this applies to gs2 as well so first part may they will ask you to explain uh, something related to static so for example post independence uh, history for example take. recently we had this uh, museum of the prime ministers right ha huh. that was inaugurated in delhi yes did you follow that current affairs so what can be connected from the past they can ask you the contributions of prime ministers over the years yes so you are like picking up a theme from the start you like pick you like picking up a theme from the past from the theoretical poly, uh, this one uh, theoretical aspect of the post independence history and then you are trying to connect it with what is happening at the current moment you getting the point for example the question might come uh, come like this recently a national museum uh, of prime minister has been inaugurated in delhi so what do you think or, or what are the contributions made by the previous uh, prime ministers in the economic development of the country as it is today so this might be the question so the current affairs is inauguration of pm museum but the topic is economic development and contributions of different pms for this so this is how they will link this is how they will link the current affairs with the static part so and this you will find with all of you psc questions yeah yeah there is this analytical part of it you will find very less straight forward questions define x and give examples very rarely you will find such questions mm. most of the questions will be interconnecting two or three main topics or themes of the entire syllabus and mind you nowadays in gs1 they actually can ask about economic development which you would think ye to gs3 ka topic hai right in our heads we are categorizing it according to it but there is a lot of interconnection that's happening there's a lot of uh, interconnection of the topics and arguments that they expect from you and that's why such questions can be there for example in when it comes to geography so recently there was assam floods they might take up to topic from assam floods and they might ask uh, they might include the disaster management part also in gs1 it might happen it can happen or so, in gs1 you could have why the flood happens how it happens the geographical part of it right yeah so that is how they will link so they will link the static part and they will take some current affairs 
so then they will ask you to analyze analyze the effects or analyze uh, uh, something else so it's all about analysis it's all about how you think so mains is all about how you think it's not about how much you know so how do you prepare for such kind of a paper when you are preparing the static part and so that's why both your static and current should be sort of done simultaneously all of us would ask how many hours should i give for reading the newspaper yes we sometimes have a question i spend a lot of time on reading the question uh, on the newspaper what should i do so newspaper editorial is important static is also important you have to somehow manage say one one and a half hour for newspaper current of the day and then you can move on to the major static part but keep connecting in your head if you have a question of or if you have an editorial on floods please go back to gs1 geography of floods if you have a question of some volcano erupting in some southeast asian country please go back to how volcan what volcanism is how you know different landforms are formed what is the uh, scientific theory behind it geographical theory behind it so what i have observed in her notes is so she mentioned volcano so what what she would have written is volcano ka uh, jo bhi geographical aspects then if there is something current happening so as i said her notes would have uh, the both static part and also the current affairs part so everything everything about uh, volcano and disaster will be in one page uh, would be in only uh, in a single page or if there is some uh, international uh, conventions which has happened on any such uh, such topic everything would be there in a single page so here you would have covered geography disaster management at the same time uh, some maybe international uh, organization or international ir topic also yes yes so, so this is how you should make notes in a single page you should cover the whole topic holistically and that is definitely going to help you right uh, we have another topic indian society can you tell me which is the basic theme from indian society which is asked every year women empowerment yes one another one cast cast poverty will go to 2 and 3 gs1 cast 100% how cast is changing how cast is impacting the society how communalism is one regionalism as i told you is one cast is one women empowerment 100 and 200% you're getting a question you are getting a question in essay you getting it in gs1 you might getting in gs2 so these are themes that you should be preparing very seriously grab an article if you find an editorial just grab it read it you know just relish it that you know there are some important points that i can just use it from this if you find an online article some website you finding it just go through it so these are themes your your uh, mental whatever antenna should be alert you know this topic is there let me just you know properly read it for my own and let me just uh, note down some important topics so we'll move on to gs2 yes so we'll take questions in between no uh, if there's anything which you have you can just you know i would like to remind you that it's a two way session you can just ask us regarding gs1 GS if you one. have covered gs1 you can ask anything about gs1 if you have any doubt yes you can just put your hands up and we'll take your question there is a question yeah mic, please sir mic in on you know mic yeah you you can come forward hello sir hello ma'am i mean it is usually said that don't make a notes on first reading uh, make a notes on after second reading and third reading ma'am what is the gap between the first reading and second reading ma'am if you give uh, too much of gap means if we read second time yes. also it will get we are reading first time only yes so we are stuck between how to make notes uh, means uh, the gap gap between first reading and second reading and third reading fine this is the yes thank you ma'am so uh, this is this question is basically applicable for static part correct say for example the newspaper for 30th july will you be going back to it after a couple of days no 30th july newspaper is gone then will come 30th august and so on so this question is applicable for static i am reading ncert for the first time should i make notes on the first go not advisable reason being first time everything sounds very fresh first time i read magma and lava i feel oh there was something like that in 6th standard now it's again feeling fresh but when i am reading about the different theories the wegener theory and what not of geography i will see that lava magma concept is extremely basic upsc is not going to throw you such questions neither in prelims nor in mains so that means that i am not going to make notes out of it now of that particular topic 
But if you are reading something from GS2, you are reading the concept of, tell me some political concept, anything. Say communalism. I'm reading about communalism from the 11th standard political science NCRT, yes? I read it and then I found over and over, over and over UPSC is asking me communalism. So yes, that particular topic becomes important for me. I might want to note down some important things from it. Uh, when it comes to the second reading, third reading, that will be more applicable for your standard books. See, what is the layer of your preparation? Base is your NCRT. That is the base. Please don't ignore it. Please don't say that I am an art student. I've taken humanities. I'll uh, leave on NCRTs. I'll directly pick on uh, the standard books. No. You can see for yourself, 2018, we had a question in GS1 that was directly drawn from 11 standard UP, uh, NCRT history. The particular uh, uh, chapter topic was picked up. So the themes UPSC is concerned about of NCRT. Do read it. Second thing of your preparation is standard books. Standard books, yes. Every standard book. The The third part of your uh, preparation is your reference books. So you don't need reference books for every subject. But say, for example, if you feel that I need to read a bit deeper for polity, so I may take up D.D. Basu as a reference. My uh, standard book will be Lakshmikant, like that. So for notes, that is all. First reading, thoda, you can sort of keep it aside. Maybe in a week, maybe in 10 days when you revisit the topic and you somehow forget a couple of concepts then you can sort of just write it down in your copy that, you know, this is something which is important, right? If I uh, have to add on to that, so to if so many people will have this doubt, so should I make notes now when you're reading this? So what you can also do is keep four uh, uh, books each for GS1234. So whatever you read, if you feel like this is uh, worth making note of, so then you note down in that particular book. So here it will not be organized because today you will be reading some topic. Again, after 10 days, you will be reading the same topic. Again. So in this page, you would have made notes. After 10 page, again, you will make the same notes. So here it will not be organized. But your doubt of uh, whether I should make this now or not, or will I miss this information if I miss it today. So this will be solved. So this is what I would advise. If you have this kind of doubt, take four books. So if you feel like this is a, a, a point worth noting down in GS2, note it down in GS2 paper. So now if it is GS4, uh, GS4, if you see some example of something, maybe in social media, you, everybody is active in social media, you'll be coming up across so many stories of uh, different ethical values mm. in social media. Yes. Note it down in your GS4, this one. So you can use it. It's very, uh, it will be very uh, new example which other aspirants will not use. So they will use uh, example of maybe Mahatma Gandhi ji or some other great leaders which everybody will know of. So we will, you, you will use some new, uh, this one which you would have picked up from the common man which is from the society. You know so that's where, that's where with the, 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 what we were telling you is create your own data bank. Yes. It's your own personalized set of book, personalized set of revision notes you can, you can just go back to again and again. Uh, and for some, a lot of us, writing down really helps us memorize it. That's also one thing. Because each of our learning capacities are different. Some of us like to write it and learn. Some of us like to read it aloud to ourselves, listen to it and learn. Some of us will, you know, just read it once and they'll be through. So we all have different learning capacities. You should understand, try and find out your own learning capacity, how you learn the best. I used to learn the best if I used to write it. So I used to write a lot. And once written, it used to be sort of highlighted in my own head that, you know, this topic is important, something like that. So you can just find that for your own self and prepare accordingly, right? As we are talking about notes, so I think uh, Madam will be uploading much of her notes also. Yeah, on my so blog, So yes. she has opened her own blog where she can interact with aspirants directly. If you have any question, you can ask her directly on the blog. She will reply to that whenever she gets time. So there she is planning to upload uh, much of her notes, whichever she finds. Just to give you an idea of, you know, how do you go about by. So we'll move on to the general studies paper two. What do we have in paper two? First thing, polity. Governance, yes. International relations, yes. What else? Anything we are missing? Social justice, yes. 
GS2 and GS3 are two such papers where every question is going to demand a connection from the current affairs. Very rarely you will have a purely theoretical question coming up in GS2 and 3. This is what the pattern we are saying right since we like 18, 19, even before that maybe, and for the last year's paper also. So GS2 and 3 is something very dynamic. Every question is demanding for you to connect it to current affairs, to contemporary happenings. So you have to prepare it that way. So there's one, uh, you know, we were just discussing, which was the most important thing that happened in the Indian polity in the last week. Yes, presidential elections. The highest constitutional post of the country, the president, and we had presidential elections. What becomes important for next year, or for this year's mains? How the presidential elections happen? What is the electoral college? And GS2 also asks you comparison with different countries. So you can just go on to study how it happens in the US or in other countries. And you can sort of give it as an example in your answer. So you have to keep a tab on the current affairs and see how you can connect it to the theoretical aspects. So while you're writing, for example, presidential election, so theoretical background which you should be knowing when it comes to mains. So while you're writing about presidential election, you should be, you should know from which constitution which, which we have adopted the election pattern. Have we adopted it from some country? Or is it a new pattern which India is following? So this will add value, uh, too much of value to your answer. So these kind of background analysis, background knowledge you should have about all the topics which are happening in current uh, affairs. Okay? Then uh, bills become very important. Whatever bill is drafted and whatever law is made, that becomes very important in that year's GS paper or it can have, would have happened last year, it becomes important for this year. So any important bill that India is discussing, you can think of. Data privacy. Data privacy, the, the uh, committee, BN Shri Krishna committee, we had it when I, we also wrote it in the mains. So since then, we are discussing over data privacy bill and it has become more important day, day by day. So you can just go on discussing. There is good important websites, you know, good uh, relevant websites which you can refer to uh, in this particular paper. In international relations, uh, the changing scenario is definitely going to be asked. And uh, what is the main pandemic where the world was facing? COVID. So how do you connect the international relations with it? You can find out about the role of WHO. You can find out about the role of other international organizations, different nations. You can study about something called as GAVI. What is GAVI? There is this global alliance for vaccines. How it is helping the you know, underdeveloped and the developing countries in uh, completing their demand for vaccines. So all of these aspects, uh, we're just trying to drive home the fact that uh, look into the current affairs, study the static part of it, prepare a good hold of it, and so you can write better answers on it. Yes? So we'll... There is one more pattern. Most of the uh, mains paper every year, so they will ask one or the other question related to international organization. So it might be UNS, UN Security Council or UNESCO, any, any organization for that matter. Uh, major international organization uh, will be covered in all the GS2 papers. At least one question, if you observe, it will be around ninth or 10th question, always. So international organizations become very important here. It's not only important for prelims. So prelims, you will take up a, a material which contains international organizations, you will just mug it up and you will reproduce. It's not only there, so here also it's very important. And also coming to GS2, what I would like to say is uh, in other topics like GS3 and all, you can skip reading the standard textbooks like Ramit Singh and all. So because it will be more of current affairs based. But in GS2, they will ask something related from to static also. Just a president election, ka, like we are talking about president election. So they might ask you the, uh, uh, ask you a part of question which will ask, uh, want you to write how president election is conducted in India. So they might ask you, uh, explain how uh, presidential election is conducted uh, in India or explain how, uh, what uh, constitutes the electoral college of presidential election in uh, India. And second part, they might ask something uh, related to other country or something like this. So reading Lakshmi Kant becomes very important here. So don't skip reading Lakshmi Kant for GS2. So there will be something or other directly asked from the static part and they will link it to the current affairs as I told. Fine, then uh, any questions on GS2? Anything which you'd like to ask?
can somebody provide mic there Good afternoon, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Here. Sir, my, my question is, sir, we are subscribed to coaching classes and all. They will make us to write the notes and all. Notes, sir. They will make us to write. So, uh, there is a dilemma that we, if we have to rely on our coaching classes notes or uh, whether to go on all other books. I attended a formal coaching and I found out that I had to make my own notes, yes. See, the study which you will do there in the class is important. But what is more important is when you come back home and you study those notes and then you try to answer a question from pre or mains. Are you able to do that from those notes? If yes, you can completely rely on it. If no, you need to move on for your own uh, kind of value addition to it. Got my point? Yes? So you are going to make your own notes there. Say, for example, somebody would explain to you or dictate to you, you'll write it down in your copy. Please go home, read it again. Does it make sense to you? Are you able to solve some question out of it? You won't be able to answer that on the same day. But when you complete that particular topic, that particular subject, and then you pick up on an answer on a question, and you try attempting it. If you are able to do it, then well and good. If not, our goal is to crack the exam. All right? So we'll take this also, we'll take that also, we'll do 200% of what is required. So uh, my uh, distinct message to you is do not rely completely on a particular source. Make your own sources, make your own bank of data, make your own bank of notes, and uh, you know that is much better. So you can do like this, if you have this doubt, if anybody has this kind of doubt. So what I would suggest is coaching institutes, they would have announced what they are going to teach beforehand. Allah sir, munchen helir tar en class is enta. So you should be able to read that first and then go and sit in the coaching class. So then pura nim deen doubt it would have been cleared. You have already read, you have went to the class, you have, sit, you have sat there, you have understood what they are uh, trying to explain, you have understood the concept, then you are making notes. So then you would have then it uh, uh, suffices both your own preparation also and also coaching notes also. So this is what you can do. But if you uh, able to, if you are able to read the topic and then go sit in the class, so that will be the most uh, beneficial thing which you'll be doing for yourself. You would have completed the whole topic then and there itself. But what happens is practically it becomes a bit difficult sometimes. You don't get time to you know beforehand do it and then sit. So you can just. Uh, go there. You, you can, if you can prepare a bit before on the topic, it's, it will be really good. So in the class, it will be more beneficial for you. Anna? We'll move on to GS3. GS3 comprises first of Indian economy. What else? Science and technology. Somebody one louder. Agriculture, food processing industry. Internal security, disaster management, environment, yes, yes. So if you see a very interesting part about GS3 is, just put the syllabus on one side and put the paper on the other side. You will find more often than not, the series of the questions is actually following the series of the topics written in the syllabus. This really happens. So you know, this is, this is so nice. That I'm picking up this one topic from syllabus and I'm seeing a question, first question coming from there. Second, third, FPI, food processing industry, I'm getting a question out of it. The good part about GS3 is it is divided into a lot of different small, small topics. So there is not one vast thing that you have to go into. You have to prepare multiple topics and you have to go into it a bit. And uh, one thing that becomes important in this paper is interconnection of arguments. So we were, we were thinking of one example. Uh, you all know cryptocurrency? How can you connect cryptocurrency to more aspects of your syllabus? You can connect it to internal security. Very correct. 
what else you can connect it to indian economy you can connect it to how it is impacting the finance of the country so basically you're taking a piece of technology and you're trying to connect it with security indian economy finances and you know other things so this shows how you are able to mind map the different topics of the syllabus and if these aspects can come out in your answer in any argument or in with any example it will be really good it will definitely fetch you more marks because the usual line of thought is we will try to follow what is there but if you are able to give some good important new dimension to the question then it is definitely going to help you fetch more marks another uh, topic which we were discussing uh, recently which country legalized the the uh, growing cannabis. of cannabis at home or anywhere like that what was that country yeah, active on thailand and thailand yes so is thailand a part of something called as the golden triangle have you read if not you'll read eventually there's something called as golden triangle there are three countries in it yes yeah so we have thailand we have laos and we have myanmar we have myanmar so can you connect the legalization of cannabis with the trade paths of that particular drugs with illicit trafficking of drugs with internal security threat to the country we can do that so what we are doing something international relation news we are connecting it with uh, internal security of the country and we can also connect it to how it will impact the culture anything so basically we are trying to mind map different topics of the syllabus using that one particular thing in news and that will really enhance the uh, marks in your answer that will really show that there is inter there is multi dimensionality of the topics which you can show so here i would like to add uh, so what i had done so what i would uh, tell all the all the aspirants those who are writing mains and maybe writing next year so don't do any mistakes in your uh, answers like if you don't know so then don't write it so don't write something which is wrong or which you are not sure of this is what i had done we, we, uh, in our mains we had got a question related to this uh, related to golden triangle and golden crescent so i was confused between thailand and cambodia laos myanmar i knew i was confused between thailand and cambodia i had drawn a ma big map and all and i had written cambodia so i am uh, theoretically wrong there so no matter how much i explain so i am wrong the whole question is gone they might give me 2 3 marks out of 15 maybe though my answer is uh, proper the analysis and the solutions or whatever which i have written is proper so i don't know which country may like i was confused between which country uh, forms the part of golden triangle so sometimes this happen so no, not everybody can remember everything sometimes this happen to everyone so then please don't mention you can just mention that golden triangle in the southeast asia you know that southeast asia so when you are not sure don't mention anything so don't commit that mistake which will uh, take away the whole marks of the one single question so it might have costed costed me 4 5 marks 4 5 marks is 40 50 ranks and also do two three services in ups so that is the uh, importance of each and every mark Uh, any questions on this part of the syllabus yes yeah somebody can just pass on the mic in the front acha okay yeah hello sir hello ma'am good afternoon uh, ma'am my question is that uh, we just mentioned that there is an interlinking of topics between gs 1 2 and 3 right so if for example in gs 1 there is a question that is asked on economic development then should our answer be more inclined towards the historical and geographical aspects or should it be more towards the economic aspects which is nothing but gs 3 so See, telling that the question is on economic part so you know that it's on economic development part you should address the economic development part mainly in your question so as you told historical and other uh, dimensions you should just give a touch of that in your answer so maybe in your introduction or in your conclusion or somewhere in uh, in between in interlinking interlinking of paragraphs so that's what you can do but you should majorly touch upon uh, 
the economic development. We'll talk about this when we'll take up answer writing answer specifically. Writing, Just after GS4, about. we'll now be discussing about how to handle the questions. Sure. There, I'll, I'll answer this in detail. Thank you. Here, somebody wanted to ask. Could you just pass on the mic? More mics, if possible. One more. Good afternoon, ma'am. How to recollect the data and example on the day of examination? I had a very good example and data, but on the day of examination, I wrote a very simple answer. I don't know. Two I words for it, revision and practice. In test series, I used a data example, but on the day of examination. We'll, we'll talk about it. We'll take up answer writing. Answer we'll, writing, we'll, we'll touch about how to there are just two words everything. for all these things. There are a lot of questions that uh, I have been also getting over this, uh, over after the selection when you interact with uh, aspirants. We read, but we forget. Obviously, you will forget. We all will forget. We are not computer programs. Enter it, save it. Don't delete it. It will be there. It will be somewhere there, but not in the re recollection, uh, uh, this thing. So we'll talk about revision and practice. Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. Anything specific to GS3? Uh, not specific. Actually, I'm a degree student and I started my preparation. And I'm usually going to give exams after two or three years. Well, my, question, my, my question is how should I prepare so that I can maintain my degree as well as. Uh, we'll, we'll come to journalistic questions later. Yours. Yeah? Thank Anything you. specific to GS3? If not, we'll be touching upon uh, all these things when we. Are, in GS3, maybe we are writing more, most of the report suggestions and all. So while we are writing the answers, so we couldn't able to figure out which report have, has to be written and how much, uh, uh, what are the points to be written in that uh, answer writing. So how to deal with that? All right, point taken. We'll address this when we address answer writing. These are all components of that. Uh, we'll move on to GS4 now. Uh, GS4 appears to be a bit different. And yes, it is different. It is not the usual editorial kind of history geography kind of a subject which you can connect what is happening in polity with economy there. No. It is, a, it is different. It is, and I did not know, but it is, yes, it is scoring. Out of all my GS papers, I scored the highest in GS4, which I was underconfident about. But then when I went through ki what I had done and how I was able to score, I realized that the, you know that there are two parts of GS4, yes? The first is, the A part which we have is, we have theory, theoretical aspects, we have uh, concepts, we have ethical values, uh, we have terms and terminologies and key terms, we have quotations, yes? And in the second part of the GS4, we have case studies. So, uh, Case studies also, we'll talk about case studies, but before that, how do you prepare for this subject? You first read the entire syllabus. You first find out what are the different key terms that are mentioned in the syllabus, and then you make your own set of whatever things, notes, whatever you find on that particular topic, on I that would, particular uh, key term. I would term. like to say, GS4, most of you are, might, must have noticed there is no set textbook or source, which you can say this is the book. So you don't have any such book for GS4. When it comes to ethics, so there is there is lexicon, which everybody will buy and nobody will read. So this is... We'll read it, but we'll not complete it. We'll not complete it because it is very factual and very theoretical. Very in -depth. Not everybody will understand it in a uh, very easy manner. And there are other books which has just focused on examples and not on theory part. So there is no one particular book which will give you everything. It's not like, there is no book like Lakshmi Kant or Ramesh Singh or Spectrum or Bishankar IAS or this, uh, this kind of a book. This makes it difficult. As she was saying, so here you should be able to make your own notes. Pick up a topic. It might be uh, a word called integrity. Make your own definition. Read so many, uh, there are so many sources. You just Google, there are so many uh, definitions you will come up with. Understand it. So then make your own definition of it. Make your own examples of it. Take a, uh, try to take up some quote regarding that and uh, uh, note down that. So I say make your own notes for each and every individual topic. 
I think this is what we have done also. This is, yes. This is the starting point of the preparation for GS4. You have objectivity. Now, what is objectivity? How is it different from non-partisanship? How, what is emotional intelligence? What are the different concepts of emotional intelligence? What is work culture? How is integrity different from honesty? So, these are the kind of questions you'll find. And for that, you need to understand that particular concept very properly. And ethics is not just about those concepts. It is about the real life application of that concept or some example which you can find of that particular concept. Because we are not going to, it's not a theoretical paper. Basically, GS4 has come very recently in the entire UPSC uh, pattern. And what it wants you to do is it needs to have you a mental framework. So when you go on field to work, you have those ethical concepts in your head which should guide you for your day to day decisions. So GS4 is more about the practical life which you will be going to face and what mental framework you need to have on that. So you start by making some notes of the ethical concepts that you can do for the first part of the paper. Another thing which is asked in this is the quotations. So we get confused how do you elaborate the quotations. For that, one and only one word, practice. Take up a quotation, anything. Start from the quotation of Mahatma Gandhiji. Because every year you're going to have a question on Mahatma Gandhiji. Every you're going to have a quotation somewhere in essay paper, somewhere in GS1 or uh, 4. Take up some quotation. Just think what are the different dimensions that are coming to your head in that. Just see how you can connect some real life example to what he is talking in that particular subject. Can you give some example of an officer? Can you give some real uh, life example which you have seen, some social media thing you would have seen? Can you quote it in your answer? Can you connect something which you saw in some movie, some poem you read? some philosopher's life you read. So you need to uh, connect that example part of it, the real life example part of it, to the theoretical concept which you are reading, right? And when it comes to case study, so case study, uh, there are different questions which we have in case study. Sir also gave me a list of those. So I'll try to address uh, that. How do you begin answering a case study? What is a case study exactly? It is a real life situation. Yes? So they'll tell you that you are, say, a district collector, or you are, say, a police officer, you are a doctor, you are a teacher, you are a something, something like that. And you will be put in a situation. You will be given that, you know, this and all these things are happening. What will be your decision? What will be the different aspects, different dilemmas that you will face in that particular uh, uh, situation? And you need to give your own answer. That is all. That is case study. So I always say that you can first start with identifying the stakeholders. What do you mean by stakeholders in a case study? Those people who are taking the decisions, those people who will be impacted by that decision. Anybody who is directly or indirectly party to that particular case, they become your stakeholder. Is that correct? So I will be also discussing at FLAG the one case study from the book. Uh, this you will find in the chapter Q&A analysis. I'll read out the case study to you and we'll sort of uh, try to solve it together. Is that okay? Yes. So the question goes like this. You are an officer in charge of transfer and posting of personnel of a particular department. What are you? In charge of transfer and posting. This position is very difficult mainly for two reasons. One. People closer to the power corridor try to influence you. Now try to identify the key term in this statement. People closer to the power corridor try to influence you. Can you tell me the key word here? Power corridor and influence. Got it? Women officers often send requests to postpone transfer orders on the pretext of family responsibilities. I'll read it again. Women officers often send requests to postpone transfers orders on the pretext of family responsibility. What is the key term here? What is to catch here? Women officers and family responsibilities. And requests. Requests. Final sentence of this uh, question is, consider the following situations and give your views with suitable explanations. Now there are two, uh, three parts of the question. A, a cabinet minister sends a DO letter. Do you understand a DO letter? DO means a demi-official letter. Demi-official is basically, they will address with, your, with their own hands, they'll write, dear. You might have seen so, this. like, 
ಪ್ರೈಮ್ ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟರ್ ರೈಟಿಂಗ್ ಲೆಟರ್ಸ್ ಟು ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಪೀಪಲ್ ನೀವು ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಮೀಡಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ನೋಡಿರ್ತೀರ ಸೊ ದೇ ಹಿ ವಿಲ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಡಿಯರ್ ಡ್ಯಾಶ್ ಡ್ಯಾಶ್ ಆರ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ ಡ್ಯಾಶ್ ಡ್ಯಾಶ್ ದೆನ್ ಪ್ಯಾರಾಗ್ರಾಫ್ ದೆನ್ ಎಂಡ್ ಮೇ ಹಿಸ್ ಸೈನ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದೋಸ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿ ಓ ಲೆಟರ್ಸ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅಫಿಷಿಯಲ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಕೇಶನ್ ಬಟ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಪರ್ಸನಲ್ ಪರ್ಸನಲ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಕೇಶನ್ ಬಿಟ್ವೀನ್ ಟು ಅಫಿಷಿಯಲ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಯಾ ಸೊ ಕ್ಯಾಬಿನೆಟ್ ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಸೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ಅ ಡಿ ಓ ಲೆಟರ್ ಟು ಯು ರಿಗಾರ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ಪೋಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಅನ್ ಅಫಿಷಿಯಲ್ on a supposedly lucrative assignment so be- before i create the uh, before i read the option uh, the part that we had read can you identify the stakeholders there tell me the first stakeholder officer in charge of transfer and posting anybody else you find anybody women officer anything else family of women officers no we'll just i'm just considering that one paragraph that we read first options we'll see later so in the opening part of this case study what you can do is you can just write the role you can do some role analysis of that post so let's do some role analysis so i'm in charge of transfer and posting what i will be expected to do what am i expected to do just think rationally you are made a person who's in charge of the transfer and posting in your state what should be the things that should be guiding you what is the expectation of that post transparency you should be able to post the best officer at the best place yes you should be you are like the hr manager you are basically posting people where they are required everybody has different skill sets you are seeing that if this particular region you know you want a woman officer to be posted over here or you want some particular person who is very good in that particular area and it has some issues of water conservation let's post this person because he has some previous experience so these are kind of theoretical aspects of that particular post you can start with that that the main important stakeholder in this is the person who's in charge of the transfers and posting and he or she will be expected to this this now one thing which you should really remember in case study is you need to go back and refer to the ethical concepts you cannot keep it just like a story you cannot keep it like an anecdote so when you told transparency yes when you told all of that words that were there in our syllabus those words should be coming in our case study so it shows that this person is aware how to connect the real life situation with the ethical concept that he or she has studied getting the point so we opened up like that so i'll just write down uh, what i had written here being a civil servant adherence to public service values of impartiality integrity transparency as well as efficient duty is of paramount importance since this posting makes one vulnerable to pressure careful analysis and objective decisions can ensure effective discharge of duty so you will find that this sentence is a lot of wrapped up in keywords what i have done is i have picked up all the keywords what are whatever is relevant to this situation i have picked up transparency i have picked up objectivity i have picked up effective discharge of duty so this shows that i am aware what subject of paper i am writing and then i am telling you what this particular person will do in that or what the stakeholder role analysis is now let us see the question a cabinet minister sends a do letter to you regarding posting of an official on a supposedly lucrative assignment for which you may have already decided about the name of a more competent officer and a, with a good track record for honesty integrity probity and timely delivery what will you do you understood the situation there is a cabinet minister so the keyword is cabinet minister cabinet minister has his own uh, hierarchical importance that person has sent you a do letter for a lucrative assignment for some person for which you have already decided a name and the person which you have decided the name of is a person who is honest and integrity and everything what will you do so can you develop some options for it can you tell me how will you go about by it anyone can just stand up anything means going people anything whatever that hits your head so this requires uh, listening to the concerns and uh, he must try to balance between the uh, listening to his higher ups uh, we must uh, examine the uh, pros and cons of both uh, listening to the higher ups in the hierarchical rank and also 
uh, without uh, compromising on the uh, post, whatever he's posting. For. Yes. So we must uh, include the, see, from the syllabus, we must include the persuasive capacity of the, we must try to persuade the cabinet minister based on logical arguments and the uh, positive points it brings with the posting of the person who has Okay, decided. that could be one option, yes. But uh, when, you when you find a request of some person and you're getting it from a cabinet minister, I'm not sure if we are in a negotiating position or in a position where we give some arguments. But you are responsible for your own thing. You are the person whose signature is going to be there in that order. So while we are given that charge, what you should best do, you should think about who is the best person to be there in that post. And what I would suggest, which I have suggested in the book is, in this scenario, the minister is trying to make a kind of an undue influence by his authority. And proposing a name without any objective criteria. That may be. Maybe the person is also competent, the one he or she is proposing. But you have already decided a person who is honest, who has integrity, and who is competent with a good track record. So what you can do is, in these kind of questions, you can develop your options. Like one option is that. Another option is what I am telling you. And another thing, you should think for yourself what you think. Whatever you write in there, that should be without compromising on all those ethical concepts which you have studied in your first part of the paper. So there is no complete black and white in the ethics paper. But it is very important to hold on to the ethical values and to the values that particular post wants you to uphold. If you are a police officer and you have to decide, it, it wants you to uphold the values of the police officer. If you are a district collector, it wants to uphold that. So you have to first stick to the position. That is why we do the role analysis. Because we first delineate that, you know, this is this role. This is he or, she's, uh, he or she's, uh, his or her role. And then we try to give the options. Fine? Got a uh, kind of a picture? Anything which you would like to ask on this? We'll go to the end. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, whether all such options should be, whether all such options should be optimistic and uh, uh, way forward, forward looking, or uh, can I give extreme uh, options also, like uh, accepting cabinet minister's advice? Yes. This is a very good uh, question. What I used to do when I used to develop options, I used to start with the worst option, which I will not select. But I will tell that I am aware of this option. So in this particular question, you can start by giving that this is one option. You can move on to second, third. You can develop such three options. And then at the end, you can say, I am going to select the third option, which is holding on the values of the post. Hey, right? Gen generally, these kind of questions, question me, they would have written, what are the options do you have? So then you should be able to write all the options. Even if it is the worst possible option, you should be right. What and all options you will have. So they will ask you, what, what are the options? What options do you have in this kind of situation? And what will you choose? Or they might directly ask you, okay, what will you choose? Then you should not go on listing, okay, this, is, this is this and all. So if they have directly asked you what you should choose, then you should uh, directly write the answer. But generally they will ask you, what are the options does the officer have? So what, uh, what does he or she should do in that option? So they will uh, delineate and ask. So you know, that will be there in the question. Right. So and, and always try to connect some theory that you've written. There are a lot of theories, utilitarian, uh, utilitarianism. Utilitarian. Yeah. Utilitarianism. Then you have uh, ends versus means debate, whether ends are important or means are important. So if you can connect that particular concept in a case study, it will be really good. Quick question. And also when it comes to ethics, Time management becomes very important. So this is one paper in GS where there is a lot to write, but you will, uh, so many people will end up uh, missing out on few questions because there are two parts. Part A is uh, uh, as you do, quotes and this kind of a thing. Second part is case studies. Part A will have 130 marks. Part B will have 120 marks, if I'm not wrong. So part B will have six questions. Part A will have 13 questions. Okay, so it is 13, uh, 130 and 120. What I would suggest is divide it according to the marks. You cannot divide it like case study I will write for uh, one and a half hours and an another one and a half hours I'll write the party. Here, like you are giving half of your time 
to 45 percent of your marks. So then you'll have to write uh, the other 55 percent in another half time. So don't do like this. Give it a time according to marks. So it should be like uh, three hours is 180 minutes and how much marks? 250. 250 yes. So it should be seven to seven minutes for 10 marks kind of a thing. Seven Generally to eight it comes minutes. down to that. 10 markers uh, require seven minutes. 15 markers require 11 minutes. 20 markers require 14 minutes. That's so all. This so this could be the that should be your, you. you should have right, your right, watch right. there. So you should, you should be looking at the watch after every question. Somewhere you will uh, go beyond one, one or two minutes beyond for a particular question. Fine. But you should not overshoot beyond that. Huh. Because if you're taking up more question to answer a question that you know, then you're taking away time from other questions which you may also attempt and know. So do not take more time for answering one that question. Yeah. Hi, sir. Hi, ma'am. So for example, there is a sentence. Abortion is legal but unethical. Yeah. So when we look at the unethical part, it is related to religious values that we cannot kill a person. And when we look at the law part, abortion is legal because it's the right of a woman to terminate her pregnancy or not. So there is a conflicting interest between both these points. So in such questions, uh, what should be the answer? What should be our answer about? See, in these kind of uh, topics, it's always controversial. So both side of arguments has their own uh, positives and negatives. So you'll always have to balance it out. You'll have to come to the middle path. So you should support both the arguments and also you should also list out the negatives of both the arguments. For example, if you come to the legal perspective, so you can mention that abortion is legal uh, till it is 20 weeks of pregnancy. So generally medical, may, what it happens after 20 weeks, the, uh, we say that uh, the child is viable, right? If, if the right term. Huh? Now they have increased, but 28, uh, maybe, whatever it is. So but sir, uh, after hmm. 24 weeks also, we can terminate the pregnancy if the fetus has any abnormalities. If the Supreme Court permits, that is, uh -huh. right? That is, uh, there are different, abortion ke liye, there are five different uh, uh, reasons under which you can abort a baby. So usme this, uh, 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 what, as you told, malformity of a baby. So it comes under a, a particular, this one, legal provision only. So it is legally, this one, because if, even if the child is born, so it will be... Uh, the quality of life of the child cannot be Cannot ensured. be assured. And then also if it affects the health of the mother, that's also a thing. Yes. So if the, even if the child... If it, if it uh, affects the health of the mother... And you know, this is a debate which is definitely very, very relevant uh, because of the recent laws that are passed in the United States. So that definitely has an implication. Please uh, go back. Uh, the very current kind of developments in the abortion laws is not something which we are very much aware of. But I will suggest that you go back and read what is there in the US, what is there in the country, what are the different debates. See, in the ethics paper, more than reaching to a final conclusion of an ethical standpoint, it is important to recognize the dilemmas that are involved. Hmm. If you do that in the major part of the question, it shows that this person is aware of what all viewpoints he or she needs to keep in his head while deciding. So the end point, you don't have to say that, you know, it's good that this abortion law is banned in US or it is bad. You don't have to give a conclusion always. You can, you should, more important is you bring out the different dilemmas that are there. The, the word uh, in, in the UPSC syllabus is ethical dilemmas. So it's important to bring out that, how the health of the mother can be affected or how the quality of life of the child is affected, you know, something like that. So uh, these kind of ethical situations you should come out with. It's not hard and fast to weigh in on one side of the topic. That's uh, you you should balance it out, come to the, uh, even if you take some stand, you should also list out the positives of the other stand also as well. So you can take as, any stand. It's as we told, individual. it's more important to recognize, recognize. the dilemmas. Okay. Thank you. So now we'll uh, move on to the final part, which is the, the uh, writing answers part. Uh, we were stressing. Uh, hello, so sir. Yeah. Here. Swalpa Nidana. Nidana ke kerte ne? Means, sir, we, sh we should always support the government here. We should support our points here. Yeah. Means, in the previous case study, right, we already had our choice, have our choice, but cabinet minister is uh, suggesting something. So, there are two choices, right? We, if we support the government, it's our incompetence. If we support ourselves, we are against government. So, uh, uh, anyhow, so, there is a dilemma, but we have question, to come to the conclusion, right? Yeah. The question that you are you're asking is very relevant. Do we, daily, day to day. 
Do we support the government in our answers? And I would like to uh, answer it for uh, all the papers. There will be a lot of questions where there will be some kind of a scheme, anything which is there in the news, and you will be expected to either support or critique it. Critically analyze. Please understand, critical. when we are writing a paper, it's not like we are standing in the shoes of a journalist or an activist. Ultimately, we are writing the paper to be a bureaucrat. And the, the simple meaning of that is, it's not like you have to blindly support the government. You can uh, give, bring out the critical aspects of the government policy. But when I say critical, it should be a constructive criticism. It should, when, when she was asking, do we have to give some optimistic point out? Yes. If you can say that this policy has these loopholes, these are some of the downsides of this policy, please tell how you can correct it. As a government officer, it will not be black and white for you, right? You are going to implement the policy. You know that some people are not getting the good benefit. What you can do best for the people? How you can bring out? So you know that government has limited resources, limited people, limited funds. How do you manage in that? So if you are giving some critique, please, please also give some way out for it. Try to think that if I am given this kind of resource, this kind of limited thing, how I will manage in that situation. So yes, you can give a criticism of the policy. You can, but it should be constructive, is what I feel. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, so then, yeah. Just use the mic, yeah. Uh, drawing the reference from any mythological stories. Wasn't that like uh, picturize our uh, answers uh, affiliated to some particular ideologies? That's like. See, you're just, see, there is no, nothing like wrong ideology or long, wrong concept. Whatever you're mentioning, you're just giving it as an example to support your argument. That's what your question is, right? Yes. So that, you need not worry that it will uh, showcase you in a particular idealistic or this kind. So uh, when you, as a bureaucrat or as, or as a civil servant, you're always neutral when it, whenever it comes. You will use both any side of, or any kind of uh, this one, to support any argument. So you are you're just using it to support your argument. So, so basically, it it's not like my entire uh, ideology is that. Uh, I'm using it to support my argument in the answer. That is absolutely acceptable. Ma'am, uh, like uh, which examples draws more weightage to the answer? Like political uh, recently happened, or uh, for example, in essay, if one uh, asks about honesty, one could uh, give example of uh, like uh, betraying the honesty like uh, from Ravana or uh, someone gives an example of Lal Bahadur Shastri. Which, which one gives a more weightage? Like, which one fetches our uh, marks more? Lesser the political, better it is. OK. Yeah. So any mythological? And you know, this is also difficult to answer. Huh. We don't get to see our answer sheets. Okay. Huh. That is right. So what we have written in the answer, we don't know which, which particular question, how many marks we've gotten. All this is a big mystery. So what we can tell you is use examples. Better to use contemporary examples. That shows a relevant connect with the real life. If at all you're using uh, anything else, any uh, mythological texts, any accepted texts that are there in our country, it's all also good. It shows that you're drawing reference from your historical or uh, mythological point of view, and you're connecting it with the real life. Again, here, the focus point is not example. The focus point is Argument. the ethical value, the okay. whatever you're like. The ethical value. I Correct. think you are, you are talking about wrong so th there is a fear that if a person gives more realistic or uh, like see there are no, no such fear so if you are using any contemporary example mm -hmm. it will be either legally backed by any court judgments mm -hmm. or essay so if it is just a theory running around don't mm -hmm. use it okay. just if anybody it is a, has written an editorial thinking like that no ramayana is accepted as a mythology as a uh, hindu this one uh, uh, holy text. So that is seen as a mythology. That will not be seen as a uh, in a context in a contemporary manner. So that you can use. That is better example. Yeah. Because here that's not example is not the main focus point. Here the focus point is the value or it, something which you are talking about. Uh -huh. And you had used another word, some uh, the leader's name. If if something of that sort is not legally an, an accepted fact or uh, you know something like that, an accepted theory, then it might backfire also. So, Don't use a settled fact. 
Use a settled fact as your reference. That's all. Anything so, controversial, try to avoid. Hmm. Uh, then moving on to final part of the, the entire session, writing answers. Uh, the book Answer Writing Manual is about entirely about that. It, is, it walks you through the preparation. We stressed so much on each and every paper. We tried to open up different aspects of the paper because as I told you, the more organized your preparation will be, the more organized your answers will come out to be. Uh, coming to the book, so we wanted to keep a book reading or book uh, related session. So where, where we should keep first anta itu. So now obviously Bangalore or Madam Wapsi Bangalore read anta first Bangalore bandri. So here we would uh, like to, I would like to say in the book mainly whatever we have discussed now it is there. So mainly we have tried to teach the aspirants, particularly those who have doubts in man answer writing. So many will be, maybe they would know already how to write answer, good answer and all. So it's good. So for those who have doubts with mains preparation and answer writing, so we wanted to address it in a very simplistic manner. So that is the reason which behind coming out with this book. So here we have tried to teach, we have tried to teach the aspirants how to write an answer. There are no, there are few model essays, there are few model answers and all. So if you give model answers, so it is just like giving a, uh, another uh, uh, example. So there which you will read and you will understand, okay, TK, this is how this answer should be. But you will not learn how to write the answer. So the main idea of the book is to uh, teach and clear doubts of the aspirants of writing an answer, how you should write an answer when it comes to UPSC. Let me tell you, it is very easy. You clearing mains in UPSC, I would say prelims is much more difficult. So if I write prelims 100 times with preparation, I might fail 40, 50 times or more than that. But if I write 100 times mains, now I can confidently say that more than 75 times I will definitely clear mains. So that is because I have understood the way of writing answer. Even if I don't have very good content, but I even with the average content, I can clear mains because I have understood how to write, how to read the question, how to understand it, how to write and what to write, what not to write. So this is the main idea which we have wanted to bring it out, which we have written in the book. So which we want to explain now also for you guys, pick up a question or so. So because it is, it runs for uh, six, seven chapters, the main gist of how to write the answer. So we thought uh, we will take some previous year question paper. So both of us will take one or two uh, question. We will explain how to read the question, how to write it, how you should go about. And the book may we have explained it very uh, in depth, ki how you should take every individual subject, uh, every individual question, how you should read and all. But now we will just give an uh, example of one, one question or two. So I'll pick up one question from GS1. These are UPSC questions. These are UPSC previous year question that we've got here. I'll read it to you. I want you to find out what are the keywords in the question. And then also try to understand what are the major factors. See, uh, always read the question twice. Got it? You're reading a sentence for the fresh first time. Read it twice. Then underline the keywords which you find in the question. There is a question directive which is there. You know what are question directives? Analyze, critically analyze, examine, describe, explain, elaborate. All of that also I have covered in one of the chapters. What do we include uh, differently in each of it? So the question goes, the life cycle of a joint family depends on economic factors rather than social values. Discuss. So this is GS paper 1 of 2014. So we don't know. This is the first time we are seeing the question. Nimtara, we are seeing the question for the first time. So uh, can you tell me? I'll repeat the question for you twice, right? The life cycle of a joint family depends on economic factors rather than social values discussed. What are the keywords? Joint family, yes. Economic factors, then social values. Anything else? Life cycle. 
that's the focus point. If I talk about joint family, 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 no. It's the life cycle of a joint family. What do you mean by life cycle of a joint family? Just think. Two people get married, have kids. Then their kids get married, have kids, and stay in the same home. That is joint, joint family, extension. So life cycle of a joint family depends on economic factors rather than social values. And it is discuss. Can you think of the arguments? Can you think of some economic factors? So basically, so there we'll is this... Yeah. Will uh, anybody explain us what have you understood by the question? What you should yeah, write what in you can, what do you, what did you understand of the question? You can but just what, do you, what you should write in this question? Anybody? Uh, be confident. We are just sharing uh, this Nobody thing. is judging Anybody? you. Yeah. UPSC Please. only will judge you. Yeah. Yeah. Mic, mic, mic. So uh, here they have asked to discuss. So like we can introduce by uh, saying that uh, in present times we are finding lot of uh, like reduced number of joint families or like extended families. We are going more into nuclear families. We can quote some fact or data, and then uh, the factors, the economic factors like. In a globalized world, economy is playing a role to sustain that kind of uh, family. And if that is not happening, then we can think of some argument. But the focus point is that social values, since it, it has reduced, so that is leading to uh, more disintegration. Uh, and then we can uh, conclude with uh, saying that, uh, uh, like, it is. As compared to other countries, we still have, uh, like, in, in a family, we have, like, parents, like, at least two generations are living, as compared to, like, US, let's say. Uh, I think. Okay. So we're all learning, and the, let me read you the question again. The life cycle of a joint family depends on economic factors rather than social values. The question is trying to drive you in the direction that the life cycle of the family, whether it will be joint, whether it will be nuclear, depends on economic factors than social Hello. values. That is the flow of the question that is given Hello, to us. Yeah. I have a point. So in the social values where uh, in the patriarchal society, the women are not uh, able to work in the patriarchal mi mindset. So most of the women stay at home. But the economic factors, if the family needs uh, to be to sustain, uh, they need to work. So the social value uh, should overcome the, uh, I mean, the economic uh, value should overcome the social value. So division of labor should be done. See, what we think, that is all. See, we are all discussing what we think the question is. We're all right now talking about the arguments. I'm just we asking the framework the of the question, the framework of the answer. Sir, in olden, in, yeah, in olden days, there is a joint family because of, uh, depends on only agriculture, agriculture life. So, but nowadays, uh, completely in, uh, depends upon globalizations and company, private sectors. So that's why, so nuclear family is dividing from the olden days family. That's my point, madam. That's See, your point on economic. That, hmm. I'll tell you. So if they had asked the question, the life cycle of the joint uh, family depends on the uh, economic factors. Explain. Rather than social factors, explain. Then you would have written this. It is discuss. You'll have to discuss. So this is what, this is what the main... Uh, that's why we were asking uh, you people. This is the, the basic thing in answer writing. You don't have to write what you know. You have to you write, have to what, write is what is expected to be written by the examiner in that answer. And that is where we sort of go away from the question. We, we think we have written full, we have filled two pages, we have written all the arguments, still we are not getting marks. 
So it is all about understanding what the examiner wants from us. What is the flow which he or she is asking us to be put on the paper? Yes. See, I'll, I'll tell you, out of 10,000 people who write mains, almost all of them are e equally well read. They know all the concepts, they know all the facts, they know all the figures. At least 8,000 of them are equally competent to, when it comes to knowledge, they're equally competent. But the key is, key is answer writing. How do you read the question? How do you understand? That's why we took up some random question. It is some random question which requires analysis. So now I think Srusti will explain I what she understood I'll from this question. Through, yeah. I'll just tell you what, what, I, what my mental framework is regarding How the this question. question. Answer should go. So All right. you, then you will understand what you are thinking, what she is thinking, because she is tried and tested and she has scored, topped. So what you are thinking, where you are going wrong. So this is just my mental framework, what I would drive from this question, okay? So it is the life cycle of a joint family. Depends on economic factors rather than, rather than social values. Question is driving you that the joint family is driven by economic factors, less by social factors, more by economic factors. That is the viewpoint of the survival of the joint family. That is the viewpoint of the question. So the major line of thought in your answer or the major part of the answer should be this. We will provide the other viewpoint that no, social is also important or this is also there. But the major flow of the answer should be on these lines. How will you open up this question? How will you introduce? What will you use to introduce like he was telling? He was correct. He was telling that we'll sort of talk about the life cycle of a joint family how it is changing, how it is prevalent in this. This is a topic of Indian society. So when you read the sociology 11, 12 textbook, you will find some of the other theoretical concepts of joint family in it. You can open up your answer by that. You can tell what, what do you mean by life cycle. You may draw a simple flow chart also there. Nuclear, this, anything, whatever factors you can think of. Then you can list out how economic factors are having a major role in impacting the life cycle. See, that's the basic expectation of the question. That's the line of thought they're asking you to do. So then you can go on like he was telling, like she's also told the correct point that, you know, uh, women are moving out. So for example, I'm living in a village. Now I need to work. I need to find work in Bangalore. What I'll do, I'll move out with my husband to Bangalore. And if I have kids there, I have a nuclear family. So this economic factor that I am joining a job in Bangalore has impacted the life cycle of my family. Yes. We know that urbanization is increasing in our country. Yes. So this urbanization which is increasing, impacting the economic factor, thereby impacting the life cycle. The main question argument here is what your flow of thought should be. Joint family, whether it will survive or not, in most of the cases, it will depend on the economic factors. Economic factors, the earning of the family together, individually. Some, some family might be earning more than others. So then there is inequality, then there is friction. So this is what the uh, flow of thought in the question. You should be able to support this because it is more, more or less true. And you should, as she was telling, you should also highlight the social factors which will in our country. Then next you can put on the social factor. First we elaborated on the, uh, this thing, the economic factors. Then we talk about the social factors. How social factors play a role? How do they play a, play a role? Say for example, uh, a person really wants his son to stay with him. I want my son to be with me. It's, it's a social value. It's something that he has learned from over the generations. So he takes, he's expecting that. So that's a social thing which is impacting the life cycle. Many a times, uh, 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 kids don't leave their house. Kids don't go out because they feel that they need to take care of the family, stay there where they are, even if it is in the village. Right? That's a social value. So taking out both those aspects, but trying to understand what is the flow of thought which is expected in that particular question. So this is what differentiates between those who could clear, those who couldn't. It's all about catching the point in the question and writing the answer. So this is what will make you clear means. Prelims is totally, uh, it is uh, upon your knowledge base. So these kind of questions here, you will not find much data. You will not find much data from your uh, any uh, uh, year-long compilation or any like this one, uh, social, sociology textbooks. Here it's all about analysis, understanding the question, analyze the question and come out with the right answer. So he started with the right introduction but his flow of thought was not in the right direction for this question. 
so she come up with a came up with a point he came up with a point uh, he came up with a point they are arguments they are not the answers they are just arguments we will so include those arguments but we will mold the structure of the answer the way it is expected in that question and also Excuse you mentioned me, about india one, one minute so you mentioned about it's in our country here they have not mentioned in india they have not mentioned the country in so, so you, you can you no no it is not mentioned india so you can use a global perspective Haan. correct you should that is to. something you can do if it is particularly mentioned india let's mm. stick to india if in there is an open in question in let us use international context and here also. the question is discuss what he was telling is explain if it was explain then you could have written in that manner if it is discuss you will have to discuss here you can give both the positive the and other negative. side of it. so you can take the other way around also you can say that no social values are more important than economic factors you can take that point so here it is discuss so but you will have you will be you will have to uh, back Stick up your majorly ah. hmm. You have to back up with it. Hmm. Ma'am, uh, here, uh, can we write the dependency of economic factors on, social, on uh, life of uh, joint family and how it is declining the social values? So we can write here. You can use those arguments. Uh, arguments is something which we all can have different ones. Only thing which we are trying to uh, drive home is that we need to understand the flow of the question which is there. Right? We'll take up. Uh, Ma'am. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Here, uh, can we quote uh, Karl Marx? Yeah, you can. Those who talked about base structure. Uh, if it is, economic. if it is supporting your argument, yes. then you can use if it. If you're a student of sociology yes, and you've read Karl Marx, yes, and if you think he's helping out to tell you something how economic factor is, you know, Everything kind of dominating, yes. you definitely can use it. We'll pick up one from 2019. Uh, we'll pick up some question from CSE 2019. Uh, GS3. GS3. It's a big question. Uh, the public expenditure management is a challenge to the government of India in the context of budget making during the post -liberal liberalization mm -hmm. period. Clarify it. This is the question. Again, I'll read it. The public expenditure management. So this is one keyword. Is the challenge, is a challenge. Challenge is a keyword to the government of India. So that's also a key keyword in the context of budget making. So during the post -liberal liberalization period, clarify it. Clarify. So this is the question word, cl clarify. Clarify. That means they are asking you to stick to what they have told you. Hmm. They're, not, they're not asking you to create some other argument of yours just for the sake of bringing arguments. They are telling, we are giving you a statement, clarify it. Give more arguments on it. Give some data on it. Give some examples on it. So this is what the directive will do. The directive will give you the hint on how to develop your answer. If it was discussed here, you could have given, ki, no, this is not, you know, this is also there, that is also there. Here it's clarify. Anybody would want to try? I will repeat question again. Somebody from the back, yeah. You can start and then we can hand over to you. This is not test of anybody, but we are just trying to explain how you generally people tend to think and how you should think. Yes. Uh, post, -liberal, post liberalization, there was uh, many FDIs coming in, foreign direct, direct investments and many industries coming up. So they had to manage all these, uh, um, all the investments in all these sectors. So there was a lot of, lot of things to be included in the budget. And this can be added as a point. It is uh, an argument. You told that FDI is coming, so a lot of things we have to invest in budget, right? Invest it may be the other way also. If the investments are coming in one sector, I as a budget maker will think that if FDI is driving in, I can drive my own funds to some place where FDI is not coming in. Right? Do you get this point? So we're talking about budget making in the context of post-liberalization period. So here the background of the answer is post-liberalization period. You're not talking about the pre-liberalization period. What happens post-liberalization is correct. He told one aspect, FDI. You can add on. How will you begin this answer? You can tell about post-liberalization. That could be the background of the question. You can open up with it. Then? Uh, I, will, uh, I will come directly to the body of the answer. 
means uh, uh, main theme is the public expenditure here. So, so uh, after uh, liberalization means uh, foreign players also coming in, in, into play in uh, India. So we have to uh, uh, means uh, manage our budget in such a manner that we have to uh, alle elevate our poverty and we have to empower uh, women and uh, those sectors. They are just a uh, revenue expenditure. Means uh, it won't, um, means the expenditure spent on one time, it's a revenue expenditure, right? Along with that, we have to manage the capital expenditure also in other perspective. So we need to, come. means uh, in my opinion, we need to compare the both aspects. So how, where we are falling short, so how we, uh, how we manage? Falling short, not majorly in this question, because if you, if I'll read it again, means public. Uh, we'll we read the question again. Yeah. The public expenditure management is a challenge to government of India in the context of budget making during the post-liberalization period, clarify it. Means we are getting the fiscal deficit, right? Every year, the fiscal deficit is growing. Means we have to concentrate on there. It's not about fiscal deficit, it's about expenditure. There because is capital, there is revenue. Only. Okay, fine, Get, got the point. Because mm -hmm. of expenditure, we are creating that amount of fiscal deficit, yeah. yes. So the, the idea is that these arguments can be included. Flow of the thought is clarifying, supporting the statement which is given to us. Let us open our question with post-liberalization. Let us tell them what happened in post-liberalization. Let us talk briefly about what budget making is. There you can quote what the current budgets are. You can quote historically what 2000, 2015 or the latest budget had. How it has incorporated the different aspects of say FDI which he was talking about, yes. This is the last question, so then we'll... Hello. Uh, hi, ma'am. Hello, sir. So, like, uh, I thought of a structure which starts from, uh, not from defining what the budget or is. I would directly start from my intro as, like, what is public expenditure? Like, I would define that, like, what does it handle? And since they asked about, like, post-liberalization, that's after LPG reforms. So, in my body, I would start with, like, saying that private handlers will have, like, more money in their hand, and that is being a... Uh, you know, like burden to the like budget making process because the government would lack or there will be like deficient with some amount of money. That money is being compensated by the private players. So there like government is trying to, uh, government is struggling to get out the like, you know, the social welfare schemes policies because they have like less budget because the private players are having the more budget. So I would write these points in the uh, like body. And since they are told to like clarify in the question, so I would uh, conclude it as like saying that uh, like, you know, minimum uh, amount of uh, go government involvement and like maximum of governance can be used like along with the using of private players in the market. Uh, what one I really liked in your this thought is minimum government, maximum governance. So that is the key here. This is the key word. This, is the this key. definitely helps in conclusions. You can use such kind of keywords. It gives a good weightage to your set of uh, arguments. See, this has an hidden, argu hidden argument also that so the government has to move away from public sectors. Because post-liberalization, private sectors are taking up uh, the market. So there, are mu there is much competition. The government should move away from public sector investment and they should uh, look into the social sector. So this is a hidden argument also. So this you should address. This is the hidden argument behind the whole question. This is where your reading of the economic survey, huh. your reading of the budget is definitely going to help you so out. So that's why I stressed upon post-public expenditure management, challenge to government in the budget context making. of budget making, post-liberalization period. So this is the hidden uh, thing in this question, which you should be able to address. This is what we wanted to explain to you guys by taking one, two question, ki what you should be able to address, what, what you should be thinking when you are reading the question paper. Because think, everybody uh, knows facts. You can also add about the challenges uh, posed to the budget making uh, yes. before yeah. and after liberalization, like uh, uh, the aid what we got for IMF had had conditionalities. Uh, it came with some feasible discipline, which we had to adhere to like FRBM Act, and we recently we had to breach the FRBM Act by point, uh, I mean around 2% of GDP, that we can quote. And That's a very uh, good, uh, correct, yeah, correct argument which is quoted. Because of this uh, WTO and all these alignments after this post-liberalization, we, uh, we have an eye on Indian economy giving a lot of subsidies, um, but because of COVID and other things in the uh, conditions back in the home, we have a lot of need for more uh, social uh, sector, uh, expenditure in the social sector. But for subsidies, we already have issues. Um, uh, yes. That's what, that is the line of your argument should be in this answer. So this is what uh, it takes to clear means. It's about how do you read, how do you understand, how do you process it in your mind, how do you come up with arguments. 
So this is what is much more required in your uh, answer writing. So this we took up because this is what we have explained in the book, majorly in the major content. So if you read the book, how many of you have read the book? There are quite a few. So if you have read the book, so you would have, you would think that, okay, I know this, but do you implement this? So that is what matters. So this is what we wanted to tell. And uh, with this, I think we should end this session because we can go on talking forever and it's also very hot and you guys are hungry. Even we are hungry. So. <laughs> I would uh, really thank you guys for being with us uh, mm. here today. So I, I hope that we've been, add, uh, we've been able to add some value to your preparation of uh, answer writing and preparation of the general studies. We would request you to, I think, kindly be seated here while we can just make our way down. And So thank you. Just We would like to invite toppers of uh, Gurukul Foundation Program and uh, Gurukul Advance Program. Nyanendra. Vandana. Rakesh from Gurukul Foundation. Pranesh from Gurukul Foundation. By now you all will be aware of the Gurukul program we have in IAS Baba. It is trying to revive the Guru Shishya Parampara and uh, constant mentorship and one-on-one -on -one, uh, intensive test programs are there. We have two format in that, Gurukul Foundation and Gurukul Advanced. So I'd like to thank IAS Baba. So we were also discussing, we were recollecting our preparation days, how we used to uh, daily, she was a... Uh, yeah, I was a student of the uh, prelims test series, of the year-long prelims test series of IAS Baba. July 2017, I think, sir, the, prelim, the prelims yearly test started. I started giving it every 15 days. The level was a bit high. I used to score less. But I think that has helped me in my final prelims exam to get through. Then uh, the daily questions which are there on the IS Baba website, uh, we both realized yesterday that we both used to solve it. That is a good boost because it sort of reminds you what was there in the current affairs that day. So uh, this is what I remember. IS Baba questions used to be sir, uh, very difficult and then maybe back then in 2016-17 when prelims used to be very easy. So we used to think of itna, malab, how, why, are, why is it so difficult? When it started 2018, mein, then we real, now we realize ki why questions need to be difficult with evolving pattern, with evolving questions, some new questions, with prelims cutoffs are coming down, they are very difficult. So thank you for preparing us because our 18 prelims was really tough. So, and I would say your daily, question, daily quizzes, FI questions which you were uh, putting up, I used to, every day I used to at attempt that before sleeping, compulsorily. So, and it, ha it had helped me in my uh, prelims preparation quite a lot. Uh, uh, she is for that matter. Answer writing, as I keep telling it, uh, I was more confident in mains. And that was all because of, uh, like uh, programs like ILP, which you know, they give you questions every single day to practice. They give you a syllabus in advance that in 15 days we're going to cover this. And then you have questions, you're practicing that. On the forum below, a lot of us share our answer sheets. So I used to put up my answer sheet on Discusser and a lot of other aspirants from around the country, I don't know them. I used to see their answers, they used to see mine. We used to comment on each other's answers. It was a good platform for peer learning as well. So uh, these kind of platforms you should definitely be taking help from. And you'd like to add anything? And also the Gurukul system, uh, the word is only is very catching. The word IS Baba is only very catching in the beginning. So the Gurukul system which you are bringing up, personal, nowadays the UPSC coaching has, uh, is rightly transformed from coaching to mentoring. 
So on that too, you are coming up with a very individual, personalized uh, mentoring thing, which is very good, which we were discussing sometime before. So all the best for that and all the best for all the Gurukul students. So that's, that's the right way to go, individual mentorship. Because coaching may, like you will sit and you will, you might learn or you might not learn, but when it comes to individual thing, you will, they say here we had so many doubts of different varieties. So that can be clarified by an individual mentor and that is a very good program is what I think. Okay, so thank you. So thank you so much. <laughs> Hopefully this e session useful to so Sorry for keeping you in this uh, hot environment. Heli. Uh, questions, whoever has questions, please come down. So, Kelgad and our, uh, we'll interact with the second floor students. We'll take up the questions there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming and uh, bearing with us for last three hours. I know it's quite difficult to sit here. It is like a sona bath here, right? So, we've been sweating, but still that uh, bearing that pain and sitting, right, is, uh, in fact, hmm? it's okay, it's okay. I can understand their pain, so I don't want to stop them. Uh, so, in fact, even for mains, you have to sit for three hours. If you can develop that habit of sitting for at a place for three hours, I think it will do wonders. Right? This is <laughs> one uh, learning practice for it. You want to add anything? For the same point, I would like to add, 218 mains, may we law, uh, wrote in Bangalore Law College, under the same sheet, three hours under scratching October sun, so it, this is what the atmosphere under which you'll be writing means. So get used to this, yeah. sitting three hours, patiently and thinking for all the three hours. Yeah. So those who have sat till now, till the last moment, uh, will have all the probability to clear this exam. Those who are living, I don't know, I cannot promise. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you once again. And we have one more bunch of students sitting in the second floor. We have to meet them. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank you.